All right, everybody, welcome to our presentation today. We are looking at the five things beginners should look for before they start investing in a real estate syndication or a passive real estate investment. But these also work for other investments too, especially anything within real estate. And we're going over this today because I want everybody to feel confidently that they can evaluate an investing opportunity in just 10 minutes. And so if you know, like, what are the five things that I need to look for here? Um, it's a really easy way to kind of go, no go any investing opportunity. So let's dive right in. The first one is to look at the returns because we get into investing to make money so that our money can make money. We want to know what type of returns are expected to be delivered and when. We want to make the money, but ultimately we want to understand the returns so that we can start to feel more of this, that type of freedom where, you know, you've just got the systems moving in the background. You've got your investing investments that are starting to pay for your expenses, for your living, and you're able to free up your time to sort of serve your highest purpose here on this planet. So when we think about returns, we're thinking about how much money am I going to make? Now, if I told you you were going to make a 35% return, you'd probably be pretty excited. That's a high number when we talk about returns. And that would look something like if you invested $10,000, you would make $3,500 on that investment. That would be pretty exciting if you were to make that in one year. That's an incredible return for a one-year return. However, it's not so exciting if it took you 15 years to make that return. So when we talk about returns, when we look at how much money am I going to make from my investments, I always want to think about the time factor here. So any numbers that you see on investments, you want to ask yourself, has, has time gone into that equation in any way? So let's look at the hold period. This is how we as real estate investors think about time, the ownership period of the asset. So if I own a building for 15 years and I get that 35% return overall 15 years, that's not very good each year, right? Very, very low returns. Um, for real estate syndications and the ones that we do, we average everything, we project everything over a five-year hold term. Um, we may hold the asset for longer, in which case, ideally, the returns would grow, or we may hold the asset for less time, in which case, you'd still get great returns for that amount of time, um, but you wouldn't have your money locked up in that investment for that amount of time. The first return we're going to look at is the equity multiple. The equity multiple is basically saying how much money is your money growing by within X number of years. And we express this as a number X, so 1.8X. Let's dive in a little deeper as far as what that means. So every five years, your money grows by generating cash flow. Those are the distributions you get throughout the life. You also get proceeds typically from a sale if that's the structure that you're joining into, right? You may only get distributions throughout the life, but maybe you get a share in the upside when that asset is sold, when the property is sold. And then you get your original investment back. And this is important. Um, because that number is factored into the 1.8x equity multiple. Now let's look at real numbers. If you were to make a $50,000 initial investment, we could say that maybe you'll generate $15,000 in cash flow through the life of that. Maybe you're going to get a $25,000 share of the proceeds, and then you'll get that originally $50,000 back to you. And that is going to give you that 1.8 X equity multiple. So if I add up those numbers, it's going to equal $90,000, which is 1.8 of that $50,000 original investment. So the reason I personally like equity multiple, it's a really easy number to digest. It gives me a quick total return calculation. How much money am I going to grow this chunk of money to in the long term? And I can also start to project that out really easily over the long term. Let's look at an example of how that works. So if in year one, I invest 50,000, we just talked about how it's possible to get $90,000 with a 1.8 X equity multiple. If I reinvest that $90,000, so no new capital is going into this, I reinvest that $90,000 into year five. That's that 1.8X equity multiple. I'm going to grow that to 1.62. That 1.62 is 1 1.8 of 90,000. Then that 1.162,000 1 
$162,000 will grow into $292,000. And finally, by in year 15, if I reinvest in year 20, I will have grown that $50,000 to $525,000. So there's some simple math here that you can really project out how big you're planning to grow your portfolio. But most of us think about returns with a percent sign at the back. You know, we think about the average stock return over the last multiple 30 year decade chunks of time, that 7% that's been adjusted for inflation. Um, we look at, we would really like, you know, maybe an eight or a nine or a 10% cash flow. Um, you're able to use that percent a little bit better. So let's look at average annual return. This is my favorite way to look at a rate of return. The average annual return is the total return over the length of time invested. So I like this one because I can also factor in that time. Now, that's <laughs> that might be still a little bit confusing. So let's go through an example here. So we're going to take the total return. This does not include the return of that original capital, that total return amount. So we're going to take just that $15,000 that we got in cash flow plus the $25,000 share of the proceeds that from our previous example, which is $40,000. I'm going to take that and divide it by five. That gives me about $8,000 I've made per year if I average it over the life of that five-year hold period. So I'm doing this calculation at the end of the investment. I'm saying this is a total pot of money that my money made. And if I spread that out evenly across all five years, I would have made $8,000 a year. Now, if we turn that into a percentage, we just multiply, we divide that by that total amount um, and we multiply by 100 to get a 16% per year annual return in this scenario. So this $50,000 investment, we got a 1.8x equity multiple, but we've also made 16% per year. That really beats that 7% stock market number out of the water. But... The returns aren't the only thing you need to understand about this investment because you are not likely going to get 16% per year. Think about that number, the 25000 that was the share of the sale proceeds. You didn't get that until the asset was sold. So this is kind of looking back upon it. Now, if you're looking for very specific numbers of cash flow distributions or the money that you're going to make every year before that asset is sold, then you need to understand the plan of the investment, right? This is the second thing every beginner should look for. What is the plan for generating cash flow within the life cycle of that deal? Now, often real estate is about adding value. We want to increase the value of these properties. We go into an apartment building, we renovate old units, we tear out old nasty carpet, we put in a new pool, we put a fresh pen of coat. Maybe that looks like renovating bathrooms in a class A luxury kind of apartment home. Maybe it looks like just replacing the flooring so people feel a fresh, beautiful sense in their new apartments. Um, it might be putting in a fitness facility in a gym or in a hotel, or like I said, just keeping up the ground so that people have a beautiful, comfortable nice place to live. So the plan is often how are we going to increase the value on the property? And beginners can look for things like value add. They can look for these planned scheduled renovations. They can see, are we, do we have a reserve fund to pay for those or are we paying for them out of the cash flow that the, the asset is already making? The plan is typically not to get 16% per year. And I think this is a big aha moment for most beginner investors and honestly, most advanced investors. Real estate is about the long game. It's about adding value to the assets and getting a great return towards the end of the deal. Now, if we averaged that over, we're getting a great return, but in year one, we're often not getting that 16%. So what might this look like? Maybe our plan is to go in and put in new cabinets into the building. Maybe we're going to put new patio around the outside. We're going to you know, improve the roof. We're going to do fresh coats of paint. We're going to do some minor repairs. That might look something like in year one, we're doing a lot of that renovation work and you may only get 3% projected distributions that year. That's not 16%. That's 3%. So you need to know that going into this investment so that you're not shocked and expecting to be able to use 16% and when you're only getting 3%. Now, maybe years two and three, you get 5% each year because there's still a few more 
upkeep more value adds that are going into this, um, but you're able, the, the funds are able to manage more distributions. You're able to get more distributions as you go. Now, maybe in year four and five, we're just chugging along now. We've been able to bring rents up to market rate. So we're getting great cash flow and we're able to give everyone that 8% return. Now, once we sell the asset, if we combine all of those numbers, we're still able to get that 16% per year. It's just distributed at different times throughout the life of an investment, often much more weighted to the end of the deal. This is extremely typical in multifamily apartment investing. When we come together as a group and we say, we're going to buy this apartment building and we're going to fix it up, make it an amazing place. We're going to manage it like you'd want to live there. And when we go to sell it on the back end, we're going to make a great return. But this is also done in hotel investing. We're adding little bits of value as we go. But what's nice is if you look at the plan for a hotel investment, the plan is actually to get you higher percentage, a higher rate of return earlier on. That might be eight or 9% in year one, but that means that your proceeds from the sale are going to be a little bit lower because typically we're always looking at deals that are in this 1.8% to 2x equity multiple range. It just depends on where you get those returns. So this is the biggest thing I want I want investors, beginning investors to start to understand. Now let's go in a little bit deeper because beginning investors will look at this and say preferred versus accrued return. We typically see a preferred return. This is the percentage of return that's paid first before anyone else gets any money. And it's typically in the seven to 9% range. So the investors here, get paid before anyone else in the deal, other than the mortgage, right? We always pay our debt. We always pay our mortgage. And then the limited partners, you, the investors, get paid that preferred return first before the owners get paid. In fact, the owners don't get paid until basically the sale of the deal. We don't get a um, share in the proceeds of this. Now, the accrued return is any percentage of that preferred return that is owed to the investor, right? So if our preferred return is 8%, in the example I just gave you, where we got 3%, 5%, 5%, 8%, you're not getting that preferred return in the first three years. In fact, that is accruing. And so the moment that there is enough cash flow, that percentage will be paid back immediately. Essentially, everyone is shored up to their preferred return immediately. And then we start splitting the proceeds according to the structure of the deal, right? So at the end of the deal, even when we have a big infusion of cash flow, usually from the sale of a property or a renovation, all of those investors get those accrued returns, but often not until the sale, uh, until that year five. So that's a big difference between preferred return and accrued return. A lot of investors look at that preferred return and they say, great, I'm going to get 8% per year. And that's not always the case, right? Again, those are those amounts that five, three, and three percent that's been accrued. That's going to get paid to you first, likely in year five, before anyone gets any split of the rest of the proceeds. Okay, number four taxes. This is one of the hardest topics to talk about, but it's one of the biggest reasons why most people get into real estate investing. The tax code favors real estate investors. The government wants us to invest in properties to give people homes and businesses places to run their business so that the economy continues to go. So there's a lot of great tax breaks for real estate investors. They're different for passive real estate investors than they are for active real estate investors. They're still there, but you just need to be able to talk to your CPA about the differences because taxes are going to be good. They're going to be great. You can save a lot of money. This increases your return over time if you know how to do it. So here's a great book that actually Julie just recommended yesterday on our popover event. It's called Tax-Free Wealth by Tom Wheelwright. And what's nice about this book, I read it a long time ago and I need to read it again, is that they they do it. He actually does speak to real estate syndications, to passive investors. A lot of CPAs don't know what these are. And so that's the first question you need to ask your CPA. Have you ever used the active or passive losses from a real estate syndication. But Tom notes that if you know how to do this correctly, if you know how to set up your entities, if you know how to move money down the chain, you essentially can avoid paying taxes for a really, really long time, if not forever. Um, and it's all legal. It's all legal. So this basically, the basic thing I want beginners to know about taxes is that you're going to generate passive losses and passive gains. Passive gains are what you earn, your distributions, those rent checks that we 
pull together and send to investors as distributions, the proceeds from the sale, these are all passive gains. You're also going to get passive losses. That means that we're going to depreciate the asset and we're going to say you have maybe 50% losses for this year that you can use against those passive gains so that you're not claiming as much income. However, the biggest thing beginners get caught up in is that you can't use those passive losses against active income, which is your W-2 income. So you really do have to play this game of building up your passive gains and your passive losses at certain amounts of times so they can kind of like weigh each other out. Again, the biggest tip here is to just talk to your CPA about this. Ask them if they've ever you you know worked with K ones, the documents that you're going to get from these investments. Ask them if they've you know if they know how to strategize to be able to help you get these tax advantages, tax breaks, right? They need to understand real estate syndications to really help you leverage the benefits of these tax advantages. Okay. Number four is the team. Wait, I'm sorry. That was already number four. This is number five. Number five is the team. The team is so important because the team are the people who are shepherding your capital. They're the ones that are managing these properties. They're putting together the deals. You want to know that they have your best interest in mind. You want to know that they've done this before, right? It's really important that they can show that, look, these are the projected returns that we had in our previous deals. And this is what we actually got for our investors. And you need to know if they are all rosy, if they are all, look, we've always exceeded returns. You might want to ask them, well, what is the worst thing that's happened to any of your deals? When is when is the la you know when has something gone wrong? What would you do in the case of a capital call? All of these types of things because the real estate is run by people at every level. The people that are evaluating the deals, they're putting together the spreadsheets, they're looking at different ways to either be conservative or squeeze out more returns as it looks for, you know, for everyone in a spreadsheet. Or they're the ones that are the boots on the ground that are actually checking up on these properties, the asset managers on the teams that are going and talking to the property managers, managing the property managers, making sure those renovations are happening on schedule everything is run by people. So my two biggest recommendations for beginners to evaluate the team is that the track record is really important to understand. So ask a team for their track record. I want to see every deal you've ever done and how it's how it's come out. And if they can't provide that to you really easily, they might you might need to continue to ask them about it, get evidence of it, talk to other investors. If they're not able to just give it to you right away, they may have something in there that they don't want to talk about. And that's what you want to flush out, right? The second thing is you need the opportunity to ask questions at every stage. So you often you hop on a, an introductory call to meet somebody, but you need to be able to continue to show up and ask questions to this group as they come up in your head, right? If they're not willing to educate you as you go and help you understand the nitty gritty, they're just wanting maybe your capital to be able to purchase this asset, right? If, if we have investors that understand what's going on, we're equipping you to be able to make confident decisions. We know that your decisions are based on your investing goals. If we know that you understand everything, the ins and outs of everything that's going on, we know that you're more confident and you're more likely to let be able to leverage this amazing resource of real estate syndications to be able to grow your wealth. So these two QR codes, you can get our full track record at the top one. The bottom one is the link to be able to sign up for our weekly chat sessions. These are on Tuesdays. Every Tuesday for half an hour, we show up, we answer investor questions, investors ask other investor questions. It's pretty um, awesome format to be able to just show up and meet the team, meet the people behind it. We have rolling members come in and out of those, which is really fun. Um, but we have lots of different ways that you can connect and learn about real estate investments. Um, we do a lot. We do these Good Egg Lives. These are a little bit more of like taking a topic and breaking it apart for you. We do those Good Egg Popovers. That's the weekly chat. We have a podcast, The Life and Money Show. Annie and I are on there talking about all things life and money. You'd think this would all be money, 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 but it's not because we're doing this to be able to live the life that we want to live. So we talk about how that all relates together there. The Laundry and Learn has come back. I don't know if we have investors on the on the session right now. Remember these from the beginning. I know I used to watch Annie and Julie and just get their download, whatever is on the top of their mind with the markets and investing. 
They go over it this every other week on Friday afternoons uh, while they fold their laundry. So this is a YouTube live event. You get to hang out with Julie and Annie there. And also just our YouTube channel. I'm really trying to grow our educational resources there. So um, be sure to go over there and like and subscribe the videos that you see. Another QR code, and that'll get you the calendar for all of these events. You can just throw it onto your Google calendar so that you never miss anything. If you want to ask more questions or you want to invest, here's some more resources for you. And I'll leave this up on the screen here. Um, you can schedule a call. You can call us directly. It'll go to a message machine and one of us will call you back that day um, or as soon as we possibly can, usually 24 to 48 hours. And other documents that you can um, learn more about real estate investing passively. All right. looks like I have one question here. Can you please explain what IRR is and does it fit into the rest of the metrics? So IRR is a good one. And I typically shy away from describing IRR because I don't use it to be able to look at these metrics. It does factor in the time component as well, but I think it does it a little bit more nitty gritty basis. I'm going to have to follow up with you. Oh, it's an anonymous comment, so I can't do that. But if you look into, we have a great resource um, and I'll include that in the follow-up email that will have the recording for this video um, that we have that kind of picks apart all of the different types of metrics because people talk about cash on cash or ROI, return on investment. There's a lot of different ways you can pull apart these numbers. But the thing I want you to understand is that you need to pick one that you really understand that helps you say, is this going to help me reach my investing goals? And just focus on that one. And for me, IRR has been like just a little bit level of complication that I don't want to deal with. So I focus on equity multiple and I focus on um the average annual return. That helps me know that like in five years or when this deal has gone full cycle, what would it have given me over the course of that? Um, because I typically think about then, I'm in the growing my wealth phase, my accumulation phase. So I'm not using my any of my distributions or returns yet. I just wanna build long-term wealth. But at some point I'm gonna be able to say, okay, I've, if I've made 1.8X equity multiple, I now have that $90,000 from my original $50,000. Now I'm gonna start to maybe use the $40,000 of earning on that. I'm not going to expect to use that earnings throughout the life of the deal because we can't, it's less likely that I'll understand what's going on because so much depends upon the sale of these assets and just the operations in those last few years of the asset. Yeah. Well, thanks everybody for joining me today. Uh, again, we'll send out an email with a recording and we'll see you next time on our Good Egg Lives. Have a great day.